Hi, welcome to Resurrection Sunday. Today we are so excited that we serve a risen living Saviour. I want to encourage you there right in your home. Stand on your feet and let's lean in and let's worship our Saviour today. Sing, there is a king. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now. Where there is praise, we will inhabit. There will be grace and mercy. Every burden will be lifted in His presence. Every trophy will be laid down at His feet. The reason name, the reigns above all waters. Jesus Christ, the King above.
sing it together. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You hid Nothing 
can't stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus
today we are so excited seeing the breakthroughs that people are experiencing in their life as they put their prayer requests in. Psalm 84 verse 4 tells us this, How happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. You know, today we can be praising God and I hope we are there in our homes. And as we praise Him, that's when we see the walls coming down and the breakthroughs happening. Somebody is praising God. We've been believing for a house move and the week gone there, they've moved into that house and we are just so excited for the future that God has for that family. So thank you, Lord, for answered prayer there. Also, somebody is thanking God this week for great exam results and actually distinctions. So we believe in asking God for the best and when we ask Him, He will do it, the Bible promises us. Also, somebody is praising God for um, a healing uh, for their partner they've been praying and believing and they saw a breakthrough and there was healing of psoriasis in their body. We really believe that God wants you well and your family well too. So we are so grateful this morning that as we ask Him, we are seeing these answers happen. As we say that, we've got some prayer requests too. And um, this week we had somebody send in a prayer request for a family that unfortunately had lost their baby. So we want to just bring that family before God today and just believe for the power of the Holy Spirit to be a comforter to them. Also, we want to just believe for breakthroughs in relationships and our family breakdowns. And uh, we just believe that God can restore and He can reconcile. Also, we want to believe for jobs. We want to continually believe for jobs. God wants our lives blessed. And you know, I really believe that as one door closes, as we ask the Lord, He is quite capable and able to open up a new door of provision for you in your life. So we want to stand with everyone believing for jobs and breakthroughs and even promotions for God to increase your life more and more. Also, let's not forget every week we want to believe for salvations. You know, Jesus came that the world might be saved and on this Resurrection Sunday we just want to believe and step into that realm of faith and believe for salvations today that people's lives will be transformed by the gospel and the preaching of the word let's pray church Father We thank you today that we can ask you all these things. You can heal bodies. You can send the Holy Spirit as a comforter. You can provide jobs for people and open up opportunities. God, we just thank you for your strength. We thank you for your provision. We thank you, Lord, that you said, ask and I will do it. I shall supply all of your needs according to my riches in glory. Through Christ Jesus is the promise of your word. So Father, as we stand on that word today, we thank you that these prayers will be answered. The breakthrough will come. And Father, we just bring people before you for salvation in their homes and their families this morning, for prodigals to return home to the house of God, that they will find rest for their weary souls, Lord. Father, we commit ourselves to you today and we thank you, Lord, that when we ask, you hear us and you will answer us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship Him. Let's sing, hold me.
you hold us in your arms, Jesus. Oh. What an incredible time of worship we've had there. But we're not finished yet. We're going to come around our tithes and offerings. Can I just encourage you with this scripture this morning? Some of us are very familiar with it, but I think it's worth reading out to us all. In John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, would have eternal life. You know, the power of love is manifest through our giving. God so loved, He gave His one and only. I wonder what thing we have in our life that God is asking us to give this morning. I wonder what kind of faith we have to step out there and to sow into the kingdom of God. You know, the Son of God was God's best that He gave to us. I want to encourage you this morning on this Resurrection Sunday. Maybe it's a step of faith that you need to take today in your giving, that you decide in your heart, Lord, today of all days, I'm going to give my best. I'm going to give what is dear to me, to you, and I'm going to sow it into the kingdom of God that I can see fruit in my life in the future. You know, the Bible teaches us there is seed time, or praise God, there will also be a harvest time. I just believe today that as you bring your tithes and you give your offerings into the kingdom of God, that you will see a harvest time in your life, a time of flourishing. Let's just pray over that seed today in your life. Father, I pray for every giver under the sound of my voice today, that you will bless their life. 
that their barns will be filled, that they will experience an overflow from heaven, that you will pour them out a blessing, God, that they cannot contain, that they will experience your provision, Lord, in supernatural ways, exceeding their expectation of what they see and what they do. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that your intention for our lives is that we live a blessed life, that we be prosperous, spirit, soul, and body, that all of our needs will be met. And we thank you, Lord, that we can trust you with our finance today as we trust you with our lives. In Jesus' name, thank you, church, for your spirit of generosity this morning. Well, church, it's my privilege to bring God's Word to you on this Resurrection Sunday. And let me just remind you, today is a day of victory. Jesus has for us overcome Satan, sin, and the grave. And he wants us to live in the light of that victory. The title of my message today is Jesus is King. And I want to encourage you to lean in. Get your Bibles, notebooks ready. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And I believe God wants us to live in the reality of what it means to belong to Jesus, the King. I'm going to start reading from Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 6 to 11. It talks about Jesus and it says, Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Before we talk any further, let's have a moment of prayer. Father, we just want to say thank you for your word. We realize that your word is you speaking to us. We thank you for this day, this season, this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, for all that you have accomplished for us through Jesus. We ask that as we look at your word, you would open our eyes, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. And may we not just be hearers of your word, but may we be doers of your word also, applying your truth to our life, that we might live in the freedom that Jesus has won for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Of all the titles given to Jesus, he is the Christ, the Messiah. He is Lord, he is Savior, he is Redeemer, he is Baptizer. I want us to look at the fact that Jesus is King. You know, Jesus spoke many times about the kingdom of God. And the reason he spoke about a kingdom is because there is a king. And the realm of his dominion is his kingdom. The Bible teaches us that we have been delivered from the power of darkness. And we have been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. We've been delivered from the dominion of darkness. We've been delivered, have been delivered from the dominion of Satan. And we have been translated into the kingdom or into the dominion of of God's dear son. That is a kingdom and that is a domain. That is a realm where Jesus is king. And I don't know about you, but I just like to say that. Jesus is king. I like to make a confession. Jesus Christ is Lord. I like to make confessions of faith that enable me to lean in to the provision that God has made. I like to declare the name of Jesus over my life over my home, over my family, the lordship of Jesus and his reign in my life. I find myself regularly saying 
Sometimes first thing in the morning, Jesus is king. Jesus is king. If you've ever done a study on the name of Jesus, and I read in Philippians talks about the fact that Jesus was given a name, you find, you'll find that all power and all authority is given to that name. Everything that Jesus is, everything that Jesus has, everything that Jesus has accomplished is within that name. And that name was given to him, and that name was inherited by him. Hebrews chapter 1 says that Jesus by inheritance has obtained a more excellent name than the angels. And I want to look at three realms that refer to or look at Jesus being king. And those three areas is that Jesus is king by birth. The second is that Jesus is king by promise. And the third is that Jesus is king by mighty conquest. The first area that Jesus is king by birth, if you read in Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, and then also verse 9 to 12, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now we, we, we sing songs about these three individuals being kings. Or here it talks about wise men from the east. And just bear with me while, I, while I'm a little bit pedantic about something. Uh, the wise men were not actually at the nativity scene. I know we have nativity scenes, and I think they're fine. I think they should be in all the shop windows, by the, by the way. But the wise men were not actually at the nativity scene. If you read this portion in Matthew chapter 2, uh, the word child is mentioned seven times in about nine verses. And it doesn't say that they came to the stable and the child was not in a manger. The child was in a house. and they went to the house. And it doesn't refer to Jesus as being a babe like it does at his birth where the shepherds came. Uh, but the wise men, or as they're referred to technically as the Magi, they were from the east, probably around Persia. And they obviously studied the stars and the skies. They were wise men and they were looking for a star. Some say that they began actually way back in the Old Testament in Numbers, I think, chapter 24. The scripture talks about Balaam. And he was actually hired by a king to curse the children of Israel. But instead of cursing, he pronounced blessings on them. And the fourth blessing that he pronounced, one of the things he said was, a star will rise out of Judah. And so it's quite possible that from that moment a group of people started to look for this star that was to rise up. And so these individuals saw the star and uh, they knew the prophecy. And so they came to Israel, to Judah, to Jerusalem. Obviously, that's where the capital was and you would expect the king to be there. And they inquired of Herod, where is he who is to be born king of the Jews? And in verse 3, it says, when Herod heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Then uh, he makes some inquiries about where this child, this king, was to be born. And so the, the lawyers and the scholars said, well, it's to be in Bethlehem. So he relays that information to the wise men. And in verse 9, it says, and when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Verse 12 says, And being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, 
they departed to their own country another way. Now, maybe you've got, you think Aaron's got the wrong season and he's talking about Christmas. And definitely this is a Christmas story, and one that we read at Christmas time. But the reason for that season is for this season. This is the reason why Jesus was born. Notice the comparison between these three wise men and King Herod. The wise men had exceedingly great joy, but Herod was troubled. You see, Herod was a jealous, selfish, and controlling, and power-hungry individual. He wanted recognition, and you know, if anyone has any of those characteristics, they will never have joy. In fact, verse 7 says, Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. Verse 8, And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child, and when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. Well, we know that was not the truth. He had other ideas. Verse 16 says, Then Herod, when he, was, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were born in Bethlehem and in all its districts from the years, two years and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. And historians tell us that it's between 20 and 30 children that Herod killed. An atrocity that actually the Bible prophesied in the Old Testament. Historians tell us that Herod became diseased that day and actually died five days later. Herod was a real individual. He was one of six kings called Herod. They tell us that he actually killed his own son because word was going around in the community that Herod was Herod the Great, but his son was Herod the Greater. And he didn't like that, and so he killed his own son. And the reason why Herod was called Herod the Great was because that's the name he gave to himself. He married a, a Jewish woman. In fact, he had several wives, and every single one of them he either exiled or he had them killed including his favorite wife called Miriam. By, uh, historians tell us that he had her killed, but he, he regretted it later. He was a troubled individual because he wouldn't give up power. He wouldn't recognize the kingship or the lordship of Jesus. He wanted control. He got rid of anything that might be in the way. When you consider the wise men, notice what it says about them. They didn't just have joy. They didn't just have great joy, but they had exceedingly great joy, especially when they saw the star. And, um, you know, the, we, it's referred to as a star, but it, obviously stars aren't, moving, they're not wenting everywhere. It says the star went before them. Well, obviously stars don't went anywhere. Stars are pretty much stationary in, in my understanding, and they don't hover over houses. So it may have been some supernatural sign that God gave to them. It, it may be something out of the ordinary. It may have been an angel. Angels are sometimes referred to as stars, and Jesus is referred to as the bright and morning star. Whatever it was, when they saw it, they had exceedingly great Joy. They didn't just have joy. Sometimes I get joy when you know, my team Southampton win. And uh, Maria might be a little bit happy when her favorite shop has a, has a, a sale. But uh, I tell you what, we both have exceedingly great joy when we think about Jesus and his goodness in our lives. And they had exceedingly great joy when they saw the star and they followed it. And, uh, you know, I'm amazed how that in life today, we, we can have joy over things that are natural, but we can become reserved when it comes over the things of God. 
These were wise men. They were sophisticated men. They were well cultured. They were the wealthy intelligentsia, the elite of the day. These were not ignorant individuals. These were not common people. Like commoners, you know, there was a great distinction between the haves and the have nots in the day. These were sophisticated, intelligent, socially elite individuals. But when they saw Jesus, Scripture says that they fell down and they worshipped. The, the word translated to, to fall down means to throw down violently. You could refer to, you know, a vase. You throw it down and it shatters. You throw it down violently and it shatters into many pieces. That's the words that are used to describe them willfully and of their own choice, falling down before the child Jesus. These men were not ashamed to express their worship to a child king in front of other people. They worshipped exuberantly and they gave extravagantly. They gave gifts of gold, which speaks of royalty. They gave gifts of frankincense, which speaks of divinity. They gave gifts of myrrh, which speak of humanity. I think it's interesting that before they found Jesus, they had to ask about him. But after they found him and they worshipped him and they gave their gifts to honour him, they didn't have to ask. God spoke to them and gave them wisdom and direction as to how they should go back home. I love the fact that these men worshipped. I love the fact that they were expressing expressing they expressed their worship you know sometimes we might think and, and we look at ourselves don't we and sometimes we're expressive even in front of a television maybe when somebody from our team scores or you know something good happens we get expressive we get emotional but how we can come into the church and into the house of god and be motionless and unemotional I believe God wants us to learn a lesson from these. When we recognize that Jesus is king, that it's okay to lift up your hands. It's okay to worship him. It's okay to clap. It's okay to dance in the presence of him who is king of kings and lord of lords. And sometimes we think, well, we're being reverent. There's a different way to being reverent in the presence of God than to being the presence of a human individual. Maybe in the presence of a human in individual, you, you, you need to be quiet, you need to be still, but I tell you, in the presence of God, he wants us and he's looking for people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And that Jesus really is king in our life. I believe like these individuals, we will express ourselves in worship to him. Jesus is king by birth. But then Jesus is also king by promise. The truth is that God never intended for Israel to have a king. He wanted them to be, he wanted to be their king. And he wanted them to be a nation of kings and priests. But throughout scripture, it is astonishing from Genesis through to uh, Malachi, how that Jesus is promised. He's prophesied. And he is the fulfillment of, of at least 53 messianic promises from the Old Testament. For instance, we remember at this season, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, there's rejoice greatly. Look at these words. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. And remember the story how that Jesus entered into Jerusalem and the people greeted him and they waved palms and they laid palms before him and said, Hosanna, 
to the son of David. The reason why Jesus came on a donkey and not a horse, because a horse is like a warring horse. But Jesus came on a donkey. When a king arrives that way, it's, it's an indicator of peace. He came in peace. I find it very interesting that, you know, when Jesus came and, and people thought that he would restore Israel to all of its glory and get rid of all the occupying enemy. When Jesus was being the king they wanted him to be, they gave him palms. But when Jesus was king the way he needed to be, the way God wanted him to be, they gave him thorns. But Jesus is king by promise. Like I said before, there are 53 messianic prophecies recorded in Scripture that Jesus personally fulfilled. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a man by the name of Stephen Stoner. He's professor, or he was professor emeritus, I think that's how you say the word, of science and also professor of maths and astronomy. And he did a study with some of his students on what was the mathematical odds of Jesus fulfilling all 53 prophecies from the Old Testament, messianic prophecies. As they began this, they, they realized that this is actually too complicated, too vast. So they actually reduced it to the likelihood of Jesus fulfilling eight prophecies that history proves. Eight of the 53, 53 prophecies that Jesus proved, or, or that history proves Jesus fulfilled. And it's an astonishing number, but the odds were one in 10 to the power of 17. One in 10 to the power of 17. That means uh, one in one with 18 zeros following. And someone said that is like you know, getting a gold sovereign, one single gold sovereign, and putting a mark on it, and then placing it somewhere in the United Kingdom, and then covering the whole land with similar gold sovereigns, not just covering the land, but covering the land until these gold sovereigns are several feet high. And then you take someone and they, they go somewhere in the UK and they pick up a random gold sovereign and it is that marked sovereign. That is the likelihood of Jesus fulfilling all those prophecies, or eight of the proven, historically proven prophecies. See, Jesus is a miracle. The Bible is a miracle. The fact that Jesus fulfilled not just eight, but all 53 prophecies is a miracle. And I'm telling you, friends, this is not an ordinary book. This is the Word of God. And if you'll take the time to read it, if you'll take the time to study, you'll find from Genesis to Malachi and through, throughout the New Testament, that Jesus is revealed in profound ways. He is in every single book of the Bible, in some type, in some shadow, in some promises, in some promise. In Genesis, he's the seed of a woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he is the high priest. In Numbers, he is the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he is the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is the judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he is the kinsman redeemer. In Samuel, he is the trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is the reigning king. In Ezra, he is the rebuilder of broken walls. In Nehemiah, he is the restorer of the nation. In Esther, he is Mordecai. In Job, he is the ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he is the Lord, our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is wisdom. In the Song of Solomon, he is our lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah, he is the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he is the fruitful branch. In Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the wonderful four-faced man with the face of a man and a lion and an ox and an eagle. 
In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband. In Joel, he's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost and fire. In Amos, he's the burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's the one mighty to save. In Jonah, he's the great foreign missionary. In Micah, he's the messenger sent to preach the gospel with beautiful feet. In Habakkuk, he's God's evangelist crying, Revive your works, O Lord. In Zephaniah, he's our Savior. In Haggai, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he's the fountain opened up in David's house. In Malachi, he's the son of righteousness, rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he is the Messiah. He's the Christ, the son of the living God. In Mark, he's the miracle worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the baptizer with the Holy Ghost. In Romans, he's our justifier. In Corinthians, he's our sanctifier. In Galatians, he is our redeemer from the curse of the law. In, in Ephesians, he is Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he is the God who supplies all our needs. In Colossians, he is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In Thessalonians, he's the soon coming king. In Timothy, he's the mediator between God and men. In Titus, he's the faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's the friend who sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he's the great physician. In Peter, he's the chief shepherd. In John, he is love. In Jude, he is the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. And in Revelation, he is king of kings. And he is Lord of lords. He's in picture form. He's in image. He's in type throughout the scripture. He's Abel's sacrifice. He's Noah's rainbow. He's Abraham's ram. He's Isaac's well. He's Jacob's ladder. He is Issachar's burden. He's Judah's scepter. He's Moses' rod and Elijah's mantle. He's Elisha's staff and Gideon's fleece. He's Samuel's horn of oil and David's sling. He's Isaiah's poultice. He's Hezekiah's sundial. He's Peter's shadow. He's Stephen's signs and wonders. He's Paul's handkerchief and aprons. He's John's pearly white city. The Bible says he'll be husband to the widow. He'll be father to the orphan. The scripture describes him as the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon and the bright and morning star. He's the staff of life and he's honey in the rock. He's the rock in the weary land. Scripture describes him as the pearl of great price. He is the everlasting father. Scripture says the government of our life is upon his shoulders. This is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's the son of the living God. Jesus is king by promise. And we could end there. This is Resurrection Sunday. And our final point is that Jesus Christ is king by mighty conquest. He was a lamb slain, but he rose as the mighty lion of Judah. He was buried as a sacrifice. He is risen as a savior. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Verse 7 to 8. Actually, verse 6 says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Verse 7 says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. You see, the, the conquest that Jesus won in fulfilling God's great plan of redemption for us is such that if Satan had known what he had secured, what God, what Jesus had secured for us today, now, in this time, he would never have crucified the Lord Jesus. And so the apostle prays that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened so that we would know what has been accomplished 
and what has already been secured for us here in this life. Romans 5.17 says, For if by one man's offense, that is, Adam's offense, death reigned through the one. Because of Adam's sin, spiritual death reigned over humanity. Goes on to say, much more those, that's you and I, we, who have received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Philip's translation puts it this way. Live their life like kings. How can we do that? Because Jesus is king. Philip says, live their lives like kings. The Amplified Translation says, reign as kings in life. You see, whereas spiritual death reigned, Now Jesus reigns. This is why he came. Not not so that we could continue as slaves of sin, but that we could live in his righteousness, free from the dominion of sin. Jesus identified in his death. He identified with us so that we could be identified with him in his resurrection and in his being raised up and being made to sit in heavenly places at the right hand of the Father far above all the powers of darkness, far above all the spiritual foe that we have to contend with in this life. Colossians 2.15 says about Jesus' great conquest. It says that he disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, that is, in his death, burial, and resurrection. One translation says he spoiled principalities and powers. Other translation says he stripped the rulers and authorities of their powers. That's a complete Jewish Bible. The message paraphrase puts it this way. And then having drawn the sting of all the powers ranged against us, he exposed them, shattered them. Actually, this is the Phillips translation. It says, and having drawn the sting of all the powers ranged against us, he exposed them, shattered, empty, and defeated in his final glorious triumphant act. The message translation puts it this way. He stripped all the spiritual tyrants in the universe of their sham authority at the cross and marched them naked through the streets. The Passion Translation adds this, that he was not their prisoner, they were his. This raising Jesus from the dead is actually the mightiest act of God. And it makes us heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus, seated in the heavenly realm at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus himself said, all power. The actual word is, all authority is given unto me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, you go. He immediately delegated that authority to his followers, to the church. See, Jesus is king, friends. He's king by birth. He's king by promise. But what we're celebrating today is that he is king by mighty conquest. He's the king of righteousness. So you and I do not have to be slaves of sin. We do not allow, need to allow sin to have dominion over us. And, and sin is symbolic of Satan and all of his realm. Sickness and distress and all that robs us of our peace and of our joy. You know, people getting, Christians are getting distressed in these days and and they're losing their peace. I'm telling you, friends, I've not lost my peace because Jesus is king. 
whatever they're planning in the world or whatever's going on in dark places doesn't cause me to lose my peace because Jesus is king. And I believe in the kingship of Jesus and I believe in the mighty conquest that he has for me and for his church more than I believe that in the power of the enemy and what dark forces are trying to do. I'm not losing my peace because Jesus is king. I'm not losing my sleep because Jesus is king. I'm not losing my joy because Jesus is king. I'm not losing my victory because Jesus is king. And I hope that resonates with you. I, I pray that powerfully resonates with you, that it will be something in your heart that, and, and, and on your lips that you will be able to say in the days that we live in and whatever the future holds for us, Jesus is king. He's king in your heart. He's king in every area of your life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is king. Jesus is king. I hope you can say that boldly. I pray you can say that with confidence. I pray you learn to say that in every situation and every circumstance of life. It doesn't matter what's against you or who's against you. Jesus is king. Bring his reign into every realm of your life. Amen. We're going to share communion in a moment. How apt to share it at this time. But I just want to ask you, everyone that's watching or listening, can you say that Jesus is King? We can say it with our lips, but it not really make any difference in our lives. I'm asking, can you say it from your heart? Because you have bowed the knee. And you have given ownership of your life to Jesus. If not, what better day for you to make Jesus King in this Resurrection Sunday in 2021? While heads bowed and eyes closed. And Christians, I just want you to pray for those who maybe don't know Jesus. And maybe there are those who are like the prodigals gone away from the Father's house, but the King is calling them to come back home. Be in the house. Be part of the family. Christians, pray for those that are listening. And those of you that want to acknowledge the kingship and lordship of Jesus Christ in your life, we just ask you with humility to say these words after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are God's Son, that you died for my sin. You were buried, but on the third day, God raised you from the dead so that I could have eternal life. Come into my heart. I receive you as Savior, and I confess you as Lord. From this day forward, I belong to you, and you are my King. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, we would love to hear from you. We would love to help you in any way that we can. Why don't you send us an email? Go to our website, newgenerationchurch.co.uk. Just let us know, I prayed that prayer. Or maybe you want to put it in the chat, I prayed that prayer. And we'll reach out to you and help you in any way that we can. We're going to receive communion now. And you know, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he said, do this, or, or for as often as you do this, you declare the Lord's death. And that we are to do it until Jesus comes. And you know, friends, the next time he comes, he's, he's not coming on a donkey. He's coming on a horse. He's coming as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in heaven and earth and under the earth. And I just want us to take this meal, this small meal, but what it represents is so vast. And just acknowledge in my life Jesus is King in your life. 
Jesus is king. And this bread represents his body in all the natural areas of our life. We want to proclaim that Jesus is king. And this blood represents the unseen part of Jesus that was unseen before he went to the cross. As we take this, we want to declare that Jesus is king over the unseen realm of our heart, of our mind, of our emotions. Jesus is king. So, Father, we just want to say thank you that the battle has been fought and the victory has been won. And we want to celebrate over the seen realm and over the unseen realm of our lives. Jesus is king. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of your name. Amen. Let's eat and drink. God bless you, church.
love my church. I love that we praise God. I love that we believe in the Word of God. I love that we get to sow to God of our finances. I really believe that our best days are ahead. And I'm so excited that the resurrection life of God is living in you and it's in me. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. If you're new to us, drop us a line. We would love to hear from you. And if you prayed that prayer of salvation, please contact us. We would love to reach out and help you in any way that we can. Have a fantastic Resurrection Sunday. I'm sure the kids will be tucking in to their Easter eggs. And A, if you're a family, stay online and go over to Kids Church and let's celebrate this day together. Today, I really believe, is a day of victory for every single one of us. God bless you, church.